So um, what I'll be really discussing is kind of the science we use to support management and conservation of coral reefs across the Pacific Islands. I want to acknowledge that everything I'm going to be presenting is from a, a great team of folks that I've been working with, uh, had the fortunate to lead over the last 17 years at NOAA's Pacific Islands uh, Fisheries Science Center. So that's a, a relatively recent photo of our staff. Um, what I'll be talking about today is kind of a little bit about who we are. Uh, why do we care about coral reefs? And the acronym here is why do we care? Why do we recommend ecosystem-based management? And then I'm going to go into various topics of the science uh, that we use to support uh, uh, ecosystem-based management, including kind of habitat mapping <clears throat> in various means of, of monitoring. So I'll start with some examples of benthic monitoring or coral monitoring, and then go to some fish monitoring, some examples on large and small scales. And then a, another topic I'll discuss some is some of the efforts we're looking at to monitor the impacts of ocean acidification. And then how we kind of bring a lot of that information together using ecosystem models and using that as decision support tools. And then how we communicate science to the public and, and you know, for us very importantly to the resource managers at the state and federal level uh, and community level. And then a little bit of some of the things we're actually doing to actually help coral reefs directly is remove uh, marine debris. So with that, I'll go ahead and get going. The, the mission that we have is really just to provide the best sound science that we can to help this conservation and management of, of coral reefs. Our region, as you can see, is, is very, very large. We, we work in all of the U.S. areas of the Pacific, which includes all of Hawaii, the main and northwestern Hawaiian Islands, uh, the, the Marianas in Guam in the, in the western Pacific. American Samoa in the South Pacific, and then the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monuments. And for scale, I, I put the continental U.S. on there, and you can see it's just a, a vast region that is very challenging. You all already know why we care about coral reefs, but just as kind of a recap, because they provide lots of benefits for people in terms of cultural benefits, recreation, tourism, jobs, uh, food security, coastal protection. The last week's hurricanes kind of reminded us of the value of coral reefs in terms of coastal protection. And they're also the highest biodiversity systems on the planet. And this is just an example of the kind of some of the economic values from some studies that have come out of Hawaii of the tremendous economic value to the state of Hawaii uh, of coral reefs. When I talk about ecosystem-based management, uh, that often sounds very confusing and stuff, but in, in simple terms, it's, it's really trying to, to balance the ecological well-being with human well-being, reaching that balance, examining the trade-offs and reducing risks of continuing to get the benefits that people value sustainably, maintaining the ecosystem integrity and structure over the long term. Our agency recently came up with some guiding principles for ecosystem-based fisheries management, applying it here more generally to ecosystem-based management. And I'm not going to go into all of these steps or these principles of ecosystem-based management other than to say that kind of throughout the process, science is needed to help make informed decisions. Um, so throughout a, a management process, and this would be kind of the management for anything, for, but for ecosystem-based management, there's a, a, an adaptive management cycle where you, you, you define what you're going to be doing and you set your goals and your priorities and you, you come up with actions that you take and then you, you monitor to see if those actions are effective at achieving your goals and you go through that process. Likewise, almost all of those steps of the management process require information and that comes from informed information from science that's that's what my group does is help provide some of that information kind of first step is often just creating maps of where we are so we use lots of different technologies from multi-beam sonars to lidars and and aircrafts and satellites and towed cameras underwater and we create a, a range of products that tell us about the structure of the bottom the, the, the sea floor and the, the hardness or softness of the sea floor, what the cover, whether it's coral cover or sand or, or algae or what, what's composing at the bottom. And that kind of becomes the foundation for almost everything else we do. Uh, the, the biggest part of what we do is we monitor the status and trends of the ecosystems across these 40 or so islands widely separated across the Pacific. And there we, we look at the abundance and the diversity and the size and the condition of the reef fishes, of the corals, of the invertebrates, the algae, 
Uh, more recently, and with partners, we also even go all the way down to the microbes who play a huge functional role in these ecosystems. And then just last year, we, we started looking at the plankton communities because they play an important role in, in helping the ecosystems. And we look at the environmental conditions like ocean warming and ocean acidification at the same time and, and place. We, we use the same methods across all of these areas um, so that we can then compare and from that we can learn much more about how these systems work so that we can better inform how management should act. We've been doing this for a long time. We started in, in 2000. We revisit each of the reefs. For the first 10 years, we revisited the reefs uh, every two years. Now we're on a three-year cycle, so an entire archipelago. So in 2016, we did the entire Hawaiian archipelago. This year, we did the Marianas Archipelago. Next year, we'll be doing the Pacific Remote Islands and American Samoa, and we, we repeat that cycle. So in the, in the bottom, you see that we've revisited, this is the number of times we've revisited each of those locations. So, you know, between six and, and 10 times, we've revisited these sites. And, and that's really so that we, oh, and, and what does one of these trips take? So this is just the number of scuba dives it takes on each one of these surveys. These are typically three-month surveys. They're ship-based, where we put five boats in the water every day, and we have teams of, of about 20 divers doing all the surveys day in, day out for, for three months. And that adds up to, you know, about 3,000 dives on one of these survey trips, a, a huge effort to do this work. And that's so we can see how these ecosystems are changing over time. We use multiple different methods. The one up in the left is how we do our coral surveys or our benthic surveys. They, they essentially put a line on the, on the bottom and do photo transects and do identifications of of uh, 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 things. For our fish surveys, this one in the lower left, we have two paired divers who do a, a survey of cylinders. I'll show a video of that uh, next. Up in the upper right, uh, to look at large fish and also uh, benthic structure, we tow a pair of divers behind a, a small boat. So we cover huge areas on each dive for those. And I'll show you a video of that. So at the end, for a particular one of these 40 islands, we get fairly comprehensive spatial coverage around all sides of each of these islands of, and, and then document the status. So, so imagine yourself right now that you have to count the fish. That's what this diver is doing. Uh, well, this one's actually taking a video of it. But, so they have about 25 or 30 minutes, and their job is, is to identify all of the species within a uh, seven and a half meter cone or uh, uh, just 15 meter diameter. And, and they're just doing circles. They're first going through and, and tallying all of the species they see within that 15 meter diameter circle. They have a partner who's doing another 15 meter diameter circle just adjacent to them. They have a line on the bottom that marks that seven and a half meters to kind of keep, but they get calibrated a lot. But as you can see, that's really challenging. You I mean, trying to count all of those things. Uh, and and they, they, they do it amazingly accurate. We compare after each survey, they compare the, the estimates of this diver versus that diver to calibrate. We do a lot of training before these missions. So they get amazingly well at that. But you can see how hard that would be to get the size, the, the species, um, and the number of all of these. And of course, this is kind of an extreme case. This is at Jarvis Island, which is most of, one of the most biologically product, productive reef systems. So that's kind of the extreme case. Uh, but you can see the challenge. So the other method that we look at for large fish, just those that are greater than 15 centimeters or 50 centimeters, roughly a foot and a half, and also do benthic cover. And the, the, the surveys I just showed in a, in a typical survey, they cover about 300 meters squared, you know, much smaller than the size of this room. These toad diver surveys on every toe, they cover about 20,000 meters squared. So they, they give us spatial coverage that we can't otherwise get. They don't get as much taxonomic resolution. The, the, the video that's showing here, so there's two divers behind this boat. One of them is only counting large fish, and the other is quantifying the, the cover of the benthos, or how much coral cover. And that particular video was during the 2015 coral bleaching event. This was off of Maui, and you can see a lot of it was bleached coral. A lot of it had already died in that video. And I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit later. So from all of this data across the Pacific, this is kind of an example. This is kind of the 40 islands along the bottom here, kind of color coded by which archipelago they're in. Um, and the upper plot is fish biomass. So that's where we take the size and the number, and then we compute the mass of, 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 of the reef fishes. And you can see there's a fairly substantial difference from places like Kingman Reef, which is uninhabited down here, all the way down, guess where's the lowest fish biomass of the, all of the places where we work? Oahu. 
And it's not surprising, that's also where a million people live. Many of these other places have no people. Some of these other places have a few hundred people. Some have a few thousand people and a whole bunch of them none. Similarly with coral cover, so we have average coral cover across the whole of the Pacific. Again, you see significant differences for some places where the mean coral cover of these is, is around 35 to 36%, in other areas it's less than 5%. Um, and again, some of the main Hawaiian islands, like Oahu's not at the bottom, but it's on the lowish end. Um, Midway's actually at the, low, at the lowest one, but that's not because of human impacts. So it's kind of right at the edge of where corals can persist because of cold water during the winter. So now I'm gonna talk about corals for a little bit. And I'm gonna first start out with a worst case example. This is some surveys. This is, happens to be Jarvis Island right on the equator. Uh, it's a, one of the uh, US possessions. And this is three different time periods where we visited. Um, and we visited during a massive El Nino event. Um, that's what's shown in the, in the middle there. Um, so Jarvis Island was right in the middle of this massive El Nino. We just published a paper documenting that for at least the central equatorial Pacific, that is the most, the, the strongest, most intense El Nino that's ever been observed. So an extreme event. Uh, and you can see some of the changes in coral cover. It went from high coral cover to essentially totally losing the coral cover. Uh, this figure kind of shows the three visits in time plotted over something called degree heating weeks, which is a measure of how much heat was, expo was, was, was uh, exposed to these corals, or what we call thermal stress. And it's kind of both the temperature and how long that temperature was above uh, a level that the corals can tolerate. And this was the highest ever observed anywhere on the planet at this particular location. And what happened was greater than 95% of the corals died around the entire island. That wasn't at one site at the island, the entire island, the average coral cover died or, or nine, greater than 95% mortality of corals. So I'll now move to Hawaii, because it wasn't as bad in Hawaii. So I wanted to give the, the worst case scenario first. So now it's getting better. So in, in Hawaii, these are, these are maps of these, this, this thermal stress or degree heating weeks that, that NOAA produces from satellite data. So 2013 and 16 are pretty normal years. 2014 and 2015, we had very warm water in late summer and early fall. And, um, in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, I'm going to show some examples for Lisiansky Islands, which is the area in the Hawaiian archipelago that it, during the 2014 event had the most extreme heating and also had the most extreme response to corals. I'll then migrate to 2015 and talk about the main Hawaiian Islands, and you saw some of that. And there was some bleaching in the main Hawaiian Islands in 2014. In fact, at the time, that was the worst bleaching we'd ever observed here in 2014 until the next year when it was much, much, much worse. So this is, for those who don't know what bleaching is, corals are, are an animal, but they, they depend on a symbiotic relationship with an algae that we call zooxanthellae. And that's, it mostly gets its food from that algae which photosynthesizes. So it's, it's producing and providing food every day to the corals, and they, they live together like that. When the water gets too warm, or, or it could be some other stressors, but the, the one typically associated with it is when waters get one degree uh, centigrade or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit above the normal maximum that they feel, or no, normal water temperature, so not very much, one degree C, it's not a huge temperature difference, then they get kind of stressed, just like on a really hot day, we get stressed. Corals do the same thing, and, and a lot of other animals. When that happens, they expel their zooxanthellae because the water's too warm. And if, if that happens just for a very short period of time, everything's fine. But if it, if it stays warm for a very long time, and, and actually when they expel the, 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 the algae, they lose their color. So th that's why it's called coral bleaching. There's no chemical bleaching or anything like that. It's just the, the zooxanthellae are no longer there. That's where the color is, so what's left is white. So people refer to it as coral bleaching because it looks white. Um, if it happens for a very long per period of time, usually over like six weeks or eight weeks, many of the corals die. They essentially starve to death because they no longer have this food source. If, if the waters cool down, they come back normal, then they can be fine. So this is a couple sites at Lisiansky Island in the northwestern Hawaiian You can see it's mostly white, you know, completely bleached. Um, and it had, when it started, it was you know, 75% or 70% live coral 99, at this particular site, so this is one site about the size of this room, 99% of the corals at that one site died during that event. This is another view of that same event. There's another event, uh, site at Lisiansky, 
that had 45% live coral in 2014. 11 months later, that had gone down to 5%. So major, major mortality event. But again, those were only two sites. Another site at Lisiansky fared much better. A year later, most of the corals recovered at that site. And this is, this is kind of, the, again, this is that, that south, the southern Lisiansky site, which is mostly recovered, or a lot of it recovered. So there's lots of reasons for hope here. So I didn't want to end on kind of a downer. Um, on that. So kind of what does that look like in time? And from that particular method, and, and um, uh, uh, Courtney Couch uh, 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 did those surveys and, and her, did her dissertation. She was a student at the time at University of Hawaii and is actually now working in, with our group. Uh, but this was the, the observations for Lisiansky that she observed in 14 to 15 are this change in coral cover. So that's at all sites, which is not an insignificant change, but it's also not 99%. Um, so, and then this is kind of using at the same sites, the only place where we visited the exact same sites. And again, it's only four locations uh, in 2004, you know, so a decade earlier, the coral cover was higher, but it wasn't dramatically higher. So it's again, not, don't wanna paint a doom and gloom situation. So for the, since 2010, we've been doing stratified random surveys. We do a lot more sites to kind of get more happen what's happening at the whole of a system. And there we see, you know, some reductions in coral at some of the, this is stratified by different depths. So this is deeper corals, mid-depth corals, and shallow corals. And, and these are the changes in the, in the four different years that we've, we've surveyed. So there, in the mid-depths, there was fairly significant reduction of coral. Um, but if we look again at the longer term from our toad diver surveys, so this is kind of the typical survey tracks, again, covering lots of area, over the long term, we don't see a huge dramatic doom and gloom, oh, the corals are all gone sort of scenario. So again, it's, and it's not the perfect method. This is a diver being towed through the water trying to estimate coral over 200 meters squared every five minutes. So it's not a perfect measure, but it's also a good indicator that it's, it, you know, it, it hasn't disappeared. There's still healthy corals at these places. Another place in the Northwestern Twin Islands, similar sort of stuff. This is Pearl and Hermes up near Midway, large, large uh, atoll system. And again, we see some changes in the last four years and some reduction, you know, over the, the, the last uh, 15 years, but again, not necessarily draconian. There's some ups and downs. There's been some other bleaching events. There was a bleaching event in 2002, which caused this dip. It recovered from that. There was a bleaching event in 2010. It recovered. We didn't have any observations between these two points. So, but again, after the 15, 14 event in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we didn't measure a dramatic change. So that's fairly encouraging news. Likewise, at French Frigate Shoals, not a draconian, oh my gosh, the corals are all gone sort of scenario. There's, there's certainly been some reduction. I don't want to downplay it. And certainly we have lots to worry about still, but it's also not you know, kind of the end of the world sort of thing, which sometimes you, you kind of hear. So now shifting to our backyard here, the, the main Hawaiian Islands, kind of going to this October uh, 15 event or the fall of 15, fairly recently, the Department of the Hawaii Department of or, uh, Division of Aquatic Resources (DAR) uh, published the uh, uh, coral bleaching uh, recovery plan after after these statewide bleaching events. So a, a, a group, including much of our data as well as University of Hawaii data, State of Hawaii data, um, uh, Nature Conservancy data, we pooled all of our data together to see where was the bleaching most prevalent during the peak of the event, and we can see. The, the bright, the, the, the greatest where 41 to 60% was bleached was along the entire Kona coast of the Big Island, part, parts of uh, uh, the leeward side of Maui and windward Oahu were the worst uh, amount of coral that was bleached during the event. And this is actually how much the coral cover changed at all of these islands. So again, the worst mortality occurred along the Kona coast and along, along Maui, not so bad really in the other islands. And if you average around the entire state, it's about a 13% loss of coral um, during that one year or that, that event between kind of 2013 and 2015 or 2016. Roughly 13% of the corals in the state died during that event. And, you know, in a normal system without additional stressors, those should be able to recover just fine. And that's where good management comes in is making sure we do the right things so that we can help them recover. And this is just another way of showing that more by region. So this is by island. So Hawaii Island, both west and east side and how much the change 
from 2013-15 to post El Nino event. And you can see in almost all cases, with some exceptions, like Mol South Molokai didn't show any decline, but most of them had some decline. Lanai actually showed an increase during that period. But again, Maui and the Big Island had the most severe mortality or loss of coral cover during that event. Changing gears to a smaller scale and a different threat. So that was kind of all the, 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 the kind of warming temperature threats to corals. Another threat is land-based sources of pollution, um, mostly from, from um, inadequate land use practices, whether it's not appropriate agriculture or coastal development. There's lots of different reasons. So one of the projects, the state of Hawaii identified a region in West Maui as its highest priority site. So with the state and with NOAA and with many of the local community partners, we've been working for the last several years on a ridge to reef pro uh, uh, project. Our part of that has really been to document using comparable methods to what we do across the Pacific, what the benthic communities are doing. U.S. Geological Survey has been doing a, a lot of the, the water quality and looking at sedimentation to see what's actually happened. So we take a lot of the various data sets that we've been collecting and many of our partners have been collecting across the region and Brett Schumacher and our group uh, kind of uh, developed a two-page flyer on reefs for the future which used a, a technique that Tim McClanahan uh, developed using various indicators and then pulling those together to see which reefs are most likely to be resilient um, in the face of the, the, the change that we have and, 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 and Brett and company created a map of based on all of the available data of areas in the main Hawaiian Islands more or less uh, resilient to, to using these indicators uh, to, um, to change during, to, due to these various stressors. So there's some areas that did very well like uh, northwest Niihau and there's a, a, uh, an area on east Maui down here which kind of had the highest scores, I mean the best case, the worst case, uh, again not too surprising, where you have you know, 800,000 people living, we're stress, putting more stress on the reef from a whole bunch of different activities. But it's also, you know, the, the North Shore of Oahu did fairly well. So all of the islands had at least some region that did fairly well in that analysis. So now I'm gonna kind of shift to fish. So something a little bit fishy. And this is going back again to the Pacific scale. So this is kind of all of the islands where we survey. Uh, Ivor Williams in our group uh, did a statistical analysis where he looked at the fish biomass and then all of the things that could potentially be driving the patterns of fish biomass across the Pacific, environmental changes like productivity and temperature and salinity and you know, proximity to humans and, and various other things and created a model of how much fish biomass based on the environmental conditions. Primarily it was driven by productivity or upwelling or nutrients. Um, and these, the gray bars here are, are what that model would show a particular island should be able to produce in terms of fish biomass. And, and we've, we've, uh, we've plotted these according to, in, in this side, uh, declining chlorophyll, which is productivity of the, of the system. And, and that's what these gray bars are, is what it should produce. And then all the colored bars are what we actually observe during those, those thousands of dive surveys. And what we see is what they actually see in these remote places, what they're actually observing matches very closely what the model predicts biomass should be at these places. When you get to the, the right half of this plot, these are all populated areas um, with, uh, the, with increasing population density this way. So this is Oahu at the, at the far end. This is what the model would predict these places should be able to produce in terms of fish biomass. And this is what we actually observe. And you know, at places like Niihau, where there's not many people, it's a little bit reduced, or Swains Island, where there's one family that lives at Swains Island in American Samoa. But then as you get more and more density, like you know, at the end of the scale, or Guam, the most, or Oahu, the highest population, Guam, the next highest population, Saipan, the next highest population. So again, there's, there's human pressures on these reefs, and that's, that's fine. We're trying to get a balance of also getting human uses, and this is a sign of human uses. Uh, of these systems, but it has impacts. Um, another thing that we use this information on the fish do is to actually, we have legal requirements to do stock assessments of, of, of fishes as part of the fishery management uh, process. So we've used these data to actually do the first ever last year, Mark Nadon published through a fairly lengthy process of, of review, stock assessments of 27 reef fish for the main Hawaiian Islands. It was the first time that's ever been done. And, and what we found is some of those fish are overfished. So it, again, advises how we should manage. 
Also from the fishery side at a much finer scale, Kahakili on the west side of Maui, um, this small uh, area here, um, was a, a, a very popular beach. Again, that lots of lots of lots of resorts and stuff along this area. Very popular beaches, and then in late 1990s, early 2000s, suddenly there was a bunch of algae watch, washing up on the beaches. People, the tourists weren't very happy that tourism was going down. The state got very concerned, and it was because what had happened is coral cover had dropped fairly dramatically, and algal, algal cover had started increasing. So in 2009, this, the state of Hawaii did something fairly fairly amazing, they actually created a different type of marine protected area where they didn't ban all fishing. What they did is they banned the fishing of the herbivores, um, only the herbivores. So you can still fishing because MPAs, no take MPAs are often very unpopular, hard to get through a political process. This was actually very achievable. So you could take other fish, you just couldn't take the, 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 the ones that essentially are cropping off this algae. So there, there's this continual battle between corals and algae that's going on. And if you, if you take the herbivores, the things, the, the lawnmowers, essentially, the natural lawnmowers, if you take those out of the system, algae starts winning that battle. And you know, so by, by making sure those aren't removed, they've been then monitoring. So we've been working closely with the state of Hawaii since 2009 to every six months go back and resurvey the fishes and the benthos. And, and sure enough, th this is when the closure happened. And this is parrot fishes in the upper plot. And biomass has gone, of the parrot fishes has gone up 170%. Surgeon fishes and other herbivores gone up 24%. The size of the fish, which is also helps with their reproduction, has increased greatly. So that's all good news. The, the um, macroalgae has declined. The crustos coral and algae has increased, which is good. That's a settlement cue for corals. So the next step, until you have that, the corals can't recruit and, and, and recover. That looked like there was starting to be an increase in corals right up until the, the major bleaching events. And you know, so we, we think, although we, we can't prove, we, we, we think the impacts, because it was higher in other parts of Maui nearby, whoops, nearby um, that, that even though that it's still declining, we think that decline may have been worse without these these kind of protective measures. Another example, um, I mean, DAR tries to monitor, I mean, because it's all just a very small area of coastline, it's relatively, but there could be nighttime poaching and whatnot. But the, the good news is we're seeing the increase in the biomass, the best indicator that it's working. And there's, there's probably still some poaching that goes on, but the fact that the biomass of the fish that we're, they're trying to protect is going up that's a very good sign. So what kind of one of the ways, in, in, you know, particularly in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean, there's been these significant phase shifts from coral dominated ecosystems to algal dominated re, uh, ecosystems. So we've been trying, one of, this, one of our staff, uh, Dr. Adele Heenan has been trying to look at what drives the natural variability of this balance between corals. So similar to what Ivor Williams had done for the fish biomass, she's looking really just at these certain functional groups of the herbivores so we can maybe even manage just specific herbivores better and she's come up with the various relationships i won't go into all of the details but between different types of the herbivores because they all play different functional roles in different locations some of them are influenced by different environmental conditions or or the, some of them are targeted by fisheries and some of them are not so we can start to see that and, un and understand the patterns of these herbivores so again we can better manage based on, on what that information is telling us. One of the things that we're trying to improve our data is, is when divers are underwater, particularly when they're on scuba, there's a bunch of bubbles that are coined up. And if you're actually down there sometimes, you'll actually see every time you exhale, a bunch of fish you know, swim away and then they come back. And then every time you exhale, you're changing their behavior. Uh, so we, we've done a, a study between the same surveys at different times whether they're on scuba, where they're emitting bubbles, or on closed circuit rebreathers, where there's no bubbles, they do the exact same surveys. And to see how good our data is, because we're relying on all of our data, most all of our data is coming from these servals where, where bubbles are occurring. And lo and behold, what we found, this was only so far completed, or the analysis has only been done for Hawaii. But for the areas in the remote areas where fish haven't learned anything about divers, the behavior we don't see differences in the data between rebreathers and closed circuit or you know, rebreathers and scuba um, and even in the main hawaiian islands where there's not um, scuba fishing going on we don't see any differences or and in the populated area again like oahu where we do see differences 
we only see that of the species of fish that are targeted by spear fishermen. So, so I mean, again, it, it, it helps us improve the quality of our data. We could never afford to do rebreather surveys everywhere we do, you know, 3,000 dives on a survey. Um, so sh sh shifting over to kind of the, another key threat that we worry about is ocean acidification. That's often thought of as a longer term threat. We've, we've kind of been helping lead a, a global effort to look at the ecological impacts of, of ocean acidification on coral reefs. Um, and then this, similar to ocean warming, the, the, the really what's causing this is CO2 emissions. So there's this carbon budget, I won't go into all the details, but you all know that carbon emissions have been increasing you know, since uh, the industrial age started. And, and then the sources and sinks of where that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes, that, that changes. But in the end, 25 to 30% of the excess CO2 we put in the atmosphere gets absorbed into the ocean. And that changes the seawater chemistry of the ocean. That process of changing that chemistry is called ocean acidification because the pH goes down. It's not really, it doesn't actually become acidic, so that's sometimes confusing. It's still, seawater is still basic, but it's moving in the acidic direction, so that's why it's called acidification. So it's actually occurring in the ocean. We have measurements of it, so just like the Mauna Loa Observatory, CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing. CO2 in the ocean is doing exactly the same thing. This is at Station Aloha, just north of Oahu. Uh, pH is decreasing in the ocean. Um, when you're on coral reefs, it's harder to measure but because the biology is, is changing the, the chemistry of the seawater as well. So during the daytime when photosynthesis is occurring, the organisms like the zooxanthellae are uptaking carbon during the, at night, they're respiring when, and, and they're, they're giving off CO2. So that change is very different between the open ocean like at the, the station Aloha and what we measure on coral reefs where that variability is 80 times as much. So it's harder to measure. Most of what we know about the impacts of ocean acidification are from laboratory experiments where they'll put various species in a bunch of tanks and then they change the seawater in some of those cases to, to what will happen under ocean acidification and they see what happens to that organism. From 228 studies, this is, and now there's been many more that have been, this was from a 2000, uh, a 13 study by Christy Croker found that, that most of the organisms that have been studied in, in laboratories have had negative effects um, from ocean acidification, um, particularly corals, the ones that calcify a skeleton. Their ability to produce that skeleton, like a coral or a crustal, all the reef builders do very poorly in, under ocean acidification. Some of the shellfish, anything that produces anything calcium carbonate doesn't do well. The things that do really well are the fleshy algae. The thing they didn't like off Kahakili, uh, those actually do better. It's a plant, so they, they actually do better with more CO2. Um, so we, we started, well, what was the program Pacific Ramp not capturing to help us document what's going on with coral reefs from ocean acidification? So we, we, we came up with a hierarchical grid of stations. I mean, same places in the same time, but we, we added some things so we could better monitor. And of course, we can't do everything everywhere. So we, we came up with this class of stations where at one location currently, Kaneohe Bay, is, a, is the only class three. That's where we do the most. We're measuring the seawater chemistry every three hours. Everywhere else right now, we measure it every three years. A big difference. Uh, I'm going to mostly be talking about the class two stations where we measure everything in, and including the seawater chemistry, but we can only do it every three years. Um, and, and the cost of the, and then this is all driven by cost. The class three stations cost a lot more than the class twos and the class zero. So we, we do some things everywhere that are cheaper to do, and then a few things at a, at a subset of sites. The two questions that we're asking are, are reefs, or coral reefs gonna survive? And that really comes down to whether they're gonna continue producing more calcium carbonate than is removed. Calcium carbonate can get removed by organisms that eat calcium carbonate, bioeroders, including parrotfish, they eat calcium carbonate, but so do a lot of organisms bore into coral reefs, worms and snails, and so there's lots of things that eat calcium carbonate. Um, and, the ability, and, and if you just put a block of calcium carbonate out, parts of it will dissolve. So there's dissolution going on and bioerosion, so that's the removal side. Historically, there's been more production than removal. All of those laboratory experiments suggest that this balance is going to shift, that there's going to be less production. And when we've tested bioeroders, they actually do better in a high CO2 environment. So kind of the, the laboratory experiments suggest a kind of a doom and gloom scenario again. We're trying to measure in nature what's actually happening, which is much more complex than these kind of laboratory experiments. There's one organism in a tank 
and you change the chemistry over an hour and then watch it for three weeks and then you write it up and that's your study. In nature, this, that change is going to take a century. So we're trying to start observing in nature what's actually occurring. The other key question is what's going to happen to biodiversity? Each of the mass extinction events, which are kind of defined as greater than 50% of the diversity of life or the biodiversity of life is, is, goes extinct, each of those events have coincided with high CO2 events or ocean acidification events. So we're, oh, she, geez, are, are we going to lose half of the diversity over the next century or two? We want to start measuring that. Prior to our ocean acidification work, which we started in 2005, we were measuring the diversity of corals and the diversity of fish and diversity of macroalgae, the big stuff, the easy stuff. But altogether, those amount to about 1% of the diversity on a coral reef. So we started developing tools to monitor that other 99%. So as an example of that other 99%, uh, David Litchwager of National Geographic did this. This is one cubic foot of reef. This happens to be a marae. And they took all the organisms that he made this tremendous poster of that. The question we're asking is what's going to happen under ocean acidification? I'm sorry, sorry for the acronym. OA is ocean acidification. And again, our projections would be maybe something like this will happen. Will we lose half of the diversity on these coral reefs? We don't know the answer to that. Nobody's really done an adequate study. And unless we look at things that happened 80 million years ago and 250 million years ago, where we lost a lot of things. But we know we need to at least observe what we have now and see over the next decade, 20 years, 30 years, are we starting to lose some of these organisms? So we've, we've augmented what we were already doing to measure the, the carbonate chemistry, the seawater chemistry, whether ocean acidification is occurring. And then we're looking at diversity, the small stuff. And with, with San Diego State and, and UH, we're also looking at the microbes because they play a big functional role. And then we're looking through a bunch of different means, and I'll show those. We're looking at this production versus removal of calcium carbonate. To answer the question, will reefs survive? And then together, we think these are kind of an integrated ecosystem observatory. So these are, this, is what I, this is the buoy in Kaneohe Bay. So map CO2, we measure CO2 every three hours in the, in the seawater. So we only have one of those right now. So we'll talk mostly about the other things, the class two stations, where we're doing various means to look at this production versus removal. And I'll, I'll go into those in more detail. And then one kind of tool to look at, at the biodiversity. And again, I'll show you examples of each of those. So at a subset of the class two islands, which are at least four islands in each archipelago where we work, we, we, we survey the, the seawater all around the island um, so we can characterize how the seawater chemistry is changing. And then at four sites on four different sides of the island, typically north, south, east, and west, we set up these climate monitoring stations. We also have temperature recorders at four depths, one meter, five meters, 15, and 25 meters on all four sides of these islands. Now I'll we'll go down to, again, we're now to a size a little bit smaller than this room of what we do. We, we put these climate stations, we put a temperature recorder, very precision, that's measuring temperature every 15 minutes. We put three autonomous reef monitoring structures. That's the tool, and I'll, I'll show them later, that we measure biodiversity with. We, we put five calci, uh, cows, which are calcification accretion units, and I'll show that as well. We put five bio pieces of calcium carbonate that we, we look at bioerosion with. We, we take a water sample at the, sur at the reef surface, at the ocean surface, and then offshore. And I'll, I'll tell you why we do that in a, in a moment as well. We take coral cores at a subset of these sites where we look back in time at how the calcification and bioerosion have changed. And then more recently with Scripps Institution of Ocean, we started doing very high precision 3D mosaics of the surface of that, that area, again, about the size of this room. And then just for the few days that we're only at each of these islands for a few days, during that time, we, we measure the higher frequency variability of the, of the seawater chemistry. So in all, you say, how can you possibly do all that? You're only there for a couple of days. You have all those stations. So this is a video that Noah Pomeroy made of, of installing all of those things that I just showed you on a dive. So the, the, the tricky part is teaching folks to dive really fast and be efficient with their air to get all this done really, really quick. Um, the, the point is, is all of those things, the three, three cows, the water sample, the three arms, the three BMUs, uh, this one didn't, we hadn't started the, the photo mosaics. We were doing photos around the perimeter of, of that, that station. And lo and behold, you know, in a single dive, we get all of these things deployed. What wasn't shown here was there's usually a second dive. This was at a new site. Typically, it takes two dives because we have to recover the stuff from the previous dive. So this was a little bit exceptional. But it's still, it's, it can be very much every day we do another one of these stations. 
uh, when we're at these sites. So I'll uh, go ahead and skip ahead. And, um, so what do we, how do we get the data uh, from this? So this is an example of the carbonate chemistry data. And what you see, and this is again, all of the islands across the, the US Pacific, and you see patterns, some areas have, and this is a, a measure of saturation state. This could, I could have plotted this as pH or PCO2, but saturation state is kind of the best indicator of how organisms will respond. So that's often the measure we use. Um, and then you can see some areas like American Samoa have high saturation state, which is good. That, that's better for organisms. Under high CO2, you look at places like Hawaii, that's where we have lower saturation state. And we'll get back to this as well. One of the things, I told you we take offshore samples and onshore samples with no other measurements. If we just take the chemistry, the seawater chemistry offshore, if that water flows up over the reef, there's all this biological process going on. It changes the seawater chemistry. Just measuring the seawater chemistry, the carbonate chemistry of these two different locations, we can come up with estimates of whether that reef is producing or removing calcium carbonate. It's kind of amazing, actually. So we now kind of have some maps. They're, they're rough. I mean, I'm not going to say this is guaranteed, so that's why we have these other measures. But right off the bat, we see places like American Samoa should be calcifying just based on, on their seawater chemistry. Places like the main Hawaiian Islands, they're primarily respiring. They may be more worrisome uh, and so on. So then we actually have these cows out there, which are just 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter PVC plates. Very, very simple. We put them on the reef. We leave them there for three years. They start out with nothing on them. A year, three years later, there's a bunch of calcium carbonate has grown on them. And we dry that and weigh it, and we can produce maps of how much calcium carbonate was produced every three years. We now have maps of that, and here we see islands compared to other areas, production of calcium carbonate is much lower than... What's producing calcium carbonate down That's mostly crustose coral and algae. It could be coral. There's lots of organisms that produce calcium carbonate. Most of what we measure and what was in that photograph, most of that is, calcium, is crustose coral and algae. Good question. So what's driving these patterns of production of calcium carbonate? So that's kind of, so then Tom Oliver in our shop has looked at all these environmental drivers of what's, what could possibly be causing these patterns of change using various data sets. He's generated another, a model, a generalized additive model. And with, with three parameters, uh, saturation state, ocean acidification, uh, productivity, and, and wave energy, he, he can explain variance. So we think that's actually a pretty good model. So we use that just from, from the acidification side. You're looking at saturation state, which was the, the dominant driver measuring. And the, these, are, these are the dates of, of global uh, CO2 change. So 18, this is pre-industrial, what saturation state in coral reef environments typically would be like, over four. This is kind of where we're at now, kind of mean, um, mean saturation states are here. Acidification. We're going to continue in a saturation state by mid-century. We're going to be here. So we, we think we're actually already seeing this decline in the production of calcium carbonate based on saturation state. So that helps us with predicting what the future is going to be like. And this is, you know, we, we, we also measure and we put these pieces of calcium carbonate on a reef. We, we do a, a, a CAT scan, just like a hospital CAT scan, but this is a really small one that just these, these blocks are, are only yay big. And we, 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 we use a, a CT scan dimensional stu structure of the inside of that calcium carbonate. We deploy it on the reef, and then we measure the three-dimensional structure again using a CAT scan. We see the change in both the removal and the accretion and the boring. So we, we can see how much bioerosion is occurring. The other way to do that is taking these coral cores. So we do this with some colleagues at Woods Hole, and, and we see very significant environmental drivers or, or changing patterns that, that massive reef building corals when they're based on their environmental conditions. And, and it wasn't what we anticipated just from the response experiments at that time. Even in low or high CO2 environments, if you feed corals enough, like these, these ones in the green, because it has relatively low saturation state, we would have expected them not to be able to produce calcium carbonate very well. Productivity of these locations, so we're continually feeding them, so they're able to offset that by having enough food production. The, the, the more recent approach that we've done is doing these three-dimensional uh, photo mosaics. We do just tons of photographs back and forth, just again, on one dive. They do the survey uh, with, with cameras, all kind of all sides of the reef, and then they stitch all those photographs back together 
and then you can reproduce very quickly. This was actually done while they were still at sea, just earlier, you know, a couple months ago. Um, and then it sent me this image, you know, within two days of actually collecting it. That's all within the software. So we can get a really, really good three-dimensional structure of the reef. And then every three years, we can redo that. And we can see how much production and removal of the larger reef, rather than one cow unit, we're actually then trying to see, is it happening across that larger stretch of about the size of this room of coral reef? Shifting to kind of the other question we're asking, and that's about biodiversity. So, so we use these autonomous reef monitoring structures, which are nine centimeter or nine nine inches by nine inches, and 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 nine layers. Again, just PVC, very very simple, just bolted together. We leave them on the reef for three years. I mean, we capture everything that's in them, I and 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 do that. And I'll show you some examples. So, we first, when we take it apart after it's been in the water for three years, we photograph the top and bottom of every plate. So we we pull it apart carefully, photograph top and bottom. Then we can tell kind of the, the sessile community, how much the different, what, it, what, what organisms had recruited to in those three years. But the kind of the, to me, the exciting part is, is all the other stuff, the crawly stuff. And you know, so we, we sort in different size fractions. And then that's where you see these crabs and these snails and these worms, the things greater than two millimeters, we actually, those are actually identified uh, by, by taxonomists fractions we we essentially the the sessile stuff the stuff that actually grows on the plates we we actually scrape those all up um, put them in a blender and then we do DNA sequencing of that Again, it's nine inches by nine inches you know by by these different layers what we typically get is about 1500 different species from the genetics it's unbelievable I mean who would have guessed that much diversity on a coral reef I don't think anybody had that idea Another thing that we've been working with San Diego State on uh, since 2009 is looking at microbes. And again, people usually don't care that much about microbes. But what we're finding is microbes are a really good indicator for the health of the system. On the bottom there is kind of all of these various human impact things. This is uh, uh, that are done uh, at UC Santa, uh, uh, Santa Barbara. And we have a very tight relationship between the microbial measurements we do and human good indicator for us. So, so we're also measuring those. From the arms, we're starting to develop these patterns of biodiversity across the whole of the Pacific. Um, and so this is all of the various biodiversity. So we, we measure fish. And we can see like here, we have a, you know, about half the diversity of fish in Northwestern and Maine Hawaiian Islands than we do in CNMI and Guam. This one up here is the Coral Triangle. So very different patterns, and these are well known. You can see where these are called rare fraction curves. So as you increase sampling effort, if it levels off, it means you're sampling enough to, to really describe how much diversity you have. For fish and corals, these level off pretty, pretty well or become asymptotes. We, we know the diversity fairly well. For the arms, we're still undersampling. This is the motile organ with all those worms and snails and crabs and stuff, the, the things that we identify by hand these spatial patterns, but we, we, we aren't sampling enough to really nail it. We haven't reached the, the total levels of diversity. Likewise, uh, for the, the general with genetics or the molecular stuff, we, we haven't reached asymptotes. And then another thing we're doing is microbial um, functional pathway we're doing with San Diego State. And that's where a lot of the work, the engine of these reef systems is often is those things you can't even see, but that's where they're recycling all of the nutrients and helping the system function. So it becomes an indicator. So now we're trying to pull all of these different indicators of diversity together into one, instead of what we used to do is de describe diversity by the number of fish at a place or the number of coral species. We're trying to come up with indicators across all of these functional groups to get an really an indication of the resilience and the diversity of place. All of this information, I've just thrown a ton of information at you. One of the ways we do that is we, we, we use models to help. And these are, these are computer models. And we've, we've started using ecosystem models, which, which have an, a biological component, a physical environment, kind of hydrodynamic ocean currents and waves. And, 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 and we can put human activities in the model. So fishing pressures or what's going, you know, tourism things we can put into the model. And then nutrients. And those, all of those things are what are driving the biological structure. Those are pieced together. You know, I could have listed all of the various things. What I've been talking about so far are most of those, all those other various things are the measurements. So now we actually have these measurements 
so we can create these models. So the first one we did was for the island of Guam, we did a, a model. And the model then can be used to help management decisions across, what if we did this? What if we did that? And you can see how the system will respond to those changes of the ecosystem. And you can see which regulations would actually have the most positive effect on ecosystems. So we're now developing for the first time an Atlantis ecosystem model for the main Hawaiian Islands. So that'll, that'll probably take another couple of years to get that developed. We have all of the information. And this kind of near the end here is, is how do we communicate results? And who do we communicate with? So there's kind of this, what we call the wedding cake approach. So if like for some, uh, I've lost my mouse. Uh, for, for the policymakers, kind of the top of the wedding cake, we, we just want to, you know, for, for um, stakeholder groups, folks like you who are actually interested in this stuff, we want more information. Here's kind of an example of a, of a report that's more for the public that has a lot of information. Um, and then a little bit more to, to scientists, managers, and then the, kind of the primary information and the data at the bottom. So some examples, all of the information is available on our website. We produce these large reports that have kind of all of the information, kind of more like a reference uh, document. And then this is this uh, kind of more lay document. We do data reports that we provide to the public. And then we're, this is kind of an example of the report card. This is kind of for the US Congress or for the state you know, legislature for Hawaii is the condition of these places where all of this information is synthesized. And then the scientific uh, peer reviewed literature. What do we do to help? I mean, because we're, we're primarily a science uh, part of, of the process. We mostly are providing the information. One of the exceptions of what we do, since 1996, we've been removing marine debris from the reefs of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. This is some, an example. We've removed about 850 tons from the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. This is after one of the survey trips where they have all this debris piled up on the Noah ship Oscar Seti of their trip uh, last year. Another example of removing debris threat that is entangling critical, critically endangered uh, Hawaiian monk seals and green sea turtles. This, this uh, example here, I'm being told we're about to get pushed off here, but this uh, particular green turtle actually is getting cut out of this net. So I, I think you want to stay and see it swim away because that's actually, to me, kind of one of those heartwarming things. You actually feel good at the end of the day. You're not just collecting data, you're actually saving an animal's life and he's going to swim away. As a reminder, we've removed 850 tons of mostly derelict fishing gear from these uh, from these reefs. Yeah, doesn't that make you feel good? So far, they're estimating that Hawaiian monk seal recovery has changed by increased by 28 percent because of the removal of the 850 tons of nets in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. We have our next mission next year. We're going to be looking for all kinds of help. These are the dates of that mission. All of these various products, this is publications, reports, and whatnot, kind of the take home is, you know, from kind of some of the key message, the reefs in Hawaii were some significantly impacted by the 2014 and 15 bleaching events, but not catastrophically. The Hawaii, the DAR response plan is a good step in the right direction to, to be fish populations in Hawaii, particularly where it's more populated, are, are you know, are somewhat depleted. Um, but this, these herbivore management areas, or DAR, is trying to replicate at other sites around the state. So there's these other, these big threats, overfishing, land-based sources of pollution, climate change, and marine debris. And, and local solutions are, are the best thing we have to, to helping solve some of these problems. I'd like to thank my team. Everything I presented, it really came from them. They do all the work. I just talk. Um, and they and they been year after year. Lots of time in the water, lots of hard work, lots of time in front of you know computers doing modeling. So with that, I thank you and welcome any questions. Just one question. There you go. Send me an email at this, and I can send you to our debris uh, uh, person. So there, it's it's it's. The same structure, I mean, it, it typically takes about two months of, of training. You can imagine diving in something that entangles things that are much better swimmers than we are is, is, a, is a high risk thing. So there's a lot of 
uh, safety, dive and safety and small boat training that has to go. So that's about an, an eight week process for a month long expedition. Um, we're, we're hoping to get, uh, to, to grow the effort much greater than what we can provide. We essentially have one month on a NOAA ship. We're hoping to get the Coast Guard, other uh, non-governmental sources, uh, private <coughs> private foundations, whatnot, to to, to make that a, a bigger success. So right now we know on a, on a five or six week effort, we're not getting in that effort, even though they'll come back with you know, 50 to 100 tons of debris. Last estimate was something like 56 tons are accumulating up there every year. So we're, you know, we haven't, you know, we're not anywhere near keeping up with the accumulation rate. We don't really have good insight on that. Um, you, we read the papers just like you do. Um, I mean, we're, we're certainly concerned. Um, I mean, a, as it is, we've the all of the most of the work I've talked about is funded by NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program, which has been level funded since 2001 and level funding our costs now aren't the same as they were in 2001 our costs have gone up dramatically so so we're having to find different ways to do things every year and that's likely to continue or, or potentially get worse so you know anything that the you know i mean we we work for you all um so, and you all control the political process as much as anybody else so speak up Mm-hmm. 